compiling to UIs. Uh, and that's about it. So let's begin. The 12 rules. Now we're going to cover these twice. And 2 times 12 is 24, if anybody's keeping track at home. Actually, the first time we wrote the presentation, we Before wrote them all time. down. And we you know, described them all. And we came up with you know, ways we thought would be reasonable to describe them. And we doubled them. And it turned out I had 22. <laughs> turns out I had 2 times 11. And we just completely dropped one of the most fundamental rules, which is where we're going to start, which is squash and stretch. Uh, yeah, so squash and stretch is, uh, is actually one of the, the, I think, the most widely used rules in, uh, in cartoons. And you can see here a good example of what exactly it is all about. Um, you know, in real life, some bodies are totally rigid, like this thing here. I could throw it at one of your guys, and it would, it would stay the same. Yeah, I know, this, this is going to be a very violent talk. You're, you're going to hear us talk about punching each other, just, that, that's what we do. Um, also, maybe because I'm French and you hate me, I don't know. <laughs> We anyway, won't get into that here. Not again. Some bodies are really rigid, and then you know when you move them really quickly, they, they stay just the way they are. But human beings, characters, and cartoons in general, you know, they are animals and human beings most of the time. Uh, they do, they do change. And here we have a good example. If you drop something from really high, like this rubber ball, uh, in real life they will actually expand a little, and when they hit the ground, they will com contract. Uh, that's the word I think. Compress. 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 Is my French side, um, and uh, and so that's that's something they use a lot in cartoons. Not only for for the fun of it, because it's really nice to see. You know, when you see like Mickey fall to the ground, uh, it becomes like this really long thing falling really really fast. And then when he hits the ground, you can see that it really hurts because suddenly it becomes really flat. Uh, so it's for the fun of it, but it's also because it's more realistic. Uh, and here again, an example of the ball uh, dropping to the ground, and you can see when it hits the ground, we compress it when it rebounds. It stretches again, uh, and it, it doesn't look that obvious when you see the, 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 the steel frames, but when it's animated, it gets, you get this really cool effect. Uh, it also gives uh, a more fluid motion. Uh, it's kind of how you can um, imitate motion blur uh, by drawing just single frames. Uh, just by elongating the shape and then compressing it, you get this, co this, this, this uh, continuation. Yeah, continuous. So, yeah, sort of. It's hard for me today. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, no, I'll be translating for my co-speaker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's it's an awesome way, you know, to to have this really fluid motion between the frames. So if you can imagine, if you had a really small object and you had very few frames in which to draw a very fast motion, uh, very fast animation between here and there, it would look very choppy if the object appeared here and then there and then there. If you actually elongate it a little bit, not enough to be sort of disturbing, but elongated enough so that the objects are actually connected. It's going to be much easier for the user to actually distinguish this as fluid motion instead of seeing this as, you know, a ball is here and then it's there and then it's there. And also, and so what, you get more continuous motion. And also, what's interesting is that in cartoons, they don't apply the technique to the entire body itself. So the entire character, sometimes it's, you know, compresses, compresses and stretches. They apply that to parts of the character. Uh, so when you have one of the dwarves in, uh, in, in Snow White, like, moving his head really fast, you will see his cheeks, like, right? yes, they have the huge cheeks. They will elongate and compress, uh, following the motion of the, of the character. Uh, so that can be applied to, to many, many uh, small elements in cartoons, not just the entire characters. So moving on, rule number two, anticipation. Uh, I went about to try to draw a sneeze and realized that I could not, so I did this instead. So yeah. the idea is... Uh, before we yeah. keep going, uh, please do not make fun of us for the drawing. Uh, you can do that when you leave the room, we're very sensitive. Uh, we know the drawing sucks, sorry. We're actually coming from the GUI side, not the drawing side. I don't know if you knew that at all. But, well, at least uh, it's a good way to show that you can do GUIs, and if you don't know how to draw, that's fine. That's true. Maybe this is why we're in GUIs and not drawing. So anyway, anticipation is the idea of indicating what is about to happen. One of the things that's very important <coughs> in cartoon animation, as well as GUI animation, uh, is to tell the user what's going to happen. Don't surprise them by an action because you may surprise them so much that they don't actually understand what's going on. So if I was here and then all of a sudden I was over off the end of the stage, then eventually you'd realize, oh, I guess he ran over there. But wouldn't it be nice if instead you actually gave an indication of something that was about to happen so that the user can easily follow this action and understand as it's going on exactly what's happening. So I can, I can start running immediately, but what's more useful and more done in cartoons is if I actually anticipate and I sort of you know, rear back and then I take off, especially for very quick actions. If, you know, when, when characters disappear and all you see are the motion lines, 
and they're not even there anymore. Well, it's not going to make any sense if they're just standing there and then there's motion lines. You're like, well, why did they blink out of existence? But if they actually indicate that they're about to run and then you see the motion lines, then you can connect all the actions together and understand what's going on. So that's what anticipation is used for. The sneeze here is sort of rearing back to me, you know, extremely exaggerated view of what's just about to happen and then the phlegm explodes all over the keyboard. Or do you think it looks like you're going to headbutt someone? <laughs> or that I got headbutted. I'm not exactly sure. There's many ways to interpret this. Staging. So this is an interesting one uh, and we don't have a drawing for you because uh, there was not not an easy way just for us to convey what you know, staging is all about. Staging is this really uh, unclear rule. It's everything that you do in your cartoon to focus the attention of the, of the viewer towards the action that you want to show, towards the main character. So it can be you know, the, the background of the scene, like how you draw the background, like what kind of lighting you use, what kind of details you put around the character. It's also by the camera, like what is the view angle? Do you want a close up if the character is talking, or do you want a wide angle if the character is about to do an action that's going to, you know, move him across the scene? Um, so it's all those little details uh, and all those decisions you have to make to really focus the action. Uh, this is actually what's in cartoons, what's closer to what people actually do with uh, live movies. Because you know, you, you've seen those, those people with cameras and you have the director that you know, is positioning the lights and all that stuff. Uh, they do the same thing with cartoons. Uh, so this is, the, this is probably, I think, the, the, the most difficult, difficult rule to apply because it's not really a rule. It's, you know, do your best to have a very clear action on stage. Um, and the reason why um, they talk about this rule is that you really want the, the, the viewer to know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and in pretty much every cartoon, like, you can see, see that every scene has, be, has been designed uh, with that in mind. Uh, I don't know if you have a precise example. Well, you had the example of, of the objects that are drawn very simply in a scene. Or yeah, no, that's another one. Applied to another one. A lot of the rules actually overlap, uh, but, but one, of the, one of the approaches they take in general is to make things as simple as possible to indicate what's going on. If you have a lot of information on the screen, it's very hard for the user to take it in, for the, the viewer of the cartoon to take it well, in. So actually, staging helps with that. Yeah, so actually a good, example, a good example of staging in cartoons is even if you have a lot of action going on, if you, even if you have many characters moving on, their, you know, on screen, if you look at the backgrounds, the backgrounds in, in cartoons are always still, or most of the time they're, they're, they're very, very still. And that's because they don't want you to focus your attention on what's going on behind. And it's kind of the same thing that they do in movies when a character starts talking, you know, they change the, the, the aperture of the lens on the camera so that you get this blurry background so you're not distracted by, by what's going on in the, in the background. Um, so usually in cartoons they just do that by doing less work so they make less stuff. Which is always nice, I guess, for them because they already have to like, draw 20 frames per <coughs> second in a movie. Even even when they moved to computer animations, the 3D movies like Bugs Life, I was really blown away by the fact that the the leaves in the tree were moving, the, the blades of grass were moving. There's you know thousands and millions of objects moving in every frame of the scene, but it's moving so subtly that it does not distract from the information in the foreground. Right? They could have gone really wild there and completely destroyed what was going on because it would have been too much noise to process. Straight ahead versus pose to pose. Once again, we see the excellent drawing techniques of, of the artists that we hired for this. Um, this is basically the two approaches that the cartoonist had to, to drawing any particular animation. Um, in general, the most common technique is for the master animator, the, the guy who's you know, been there for, for decades, to actually draw the extreme poses. So we're going to draw the arm like this, and we're going to draw the arm like that. Right? And then the, the slave animator, the, the junior guy in the studio, can then take these two extremes and, code and say, OK, I'm going to draw the action between here and there, and, and they have you know good drawing technique and enough timing technique to know, okay, well, I'm going to accelerate into this point, you know, I know the basic intention here, um, and they can basically just take these two poses and then just create what are called these in-betweens, right? But then the other approach is called straight ahead, where you actually take um, the person that knows uh, exactly what they want in every frame uh, to not just do the two extremes, but to actually do everything in between, because they actually want something really custom to happen. Uh, and in general, this is used to have more spontaneous, more sort of active and frantic motion, where the object might actually be changing a little bit each time. And you didn't simply want this smooth animation from this extreme over to that extreme, but instead you wanted you know, some sort of action that was perturbing the object at the same time. So this is beautifully illustrated by the ball going down on the left, where if you had the two extremes at the top and the bottom on the left there, 
um, then the in-betweener could simply draw a ball moving down with gravity and, and do a decent job of it there. Um, but what if the